Je crois que le silence descend, alors c'est l'heure de, de vous introduire à M. Michael Jones, qui est professeur émérite d'histoire médiévale à l'Université de Nottingham. Il est bien connu pour son travail sur le duché de Bretagne à la fin du Moyen-Âge, euh, l'histoire militaire inclus. Il a édité des recueils, des actes euh, des ducs et aussi des contes. Et à ce moment, il m'a dit que il est en train d'éditer un autre volume euh, de comptabilité euh, ducale. Mais euh, ce qui est re remarquable, qu'il est aussi expert sur l'architecture, euh, surtout l'architecture seigneuriale de la Bretagne, qui est un sujet très intéressant. Et nous attendons euh, un autre bel volume sur ce sujet. Mais aujourd'hui, il va parler euh, d'un... Euh, C'est une expression très intéressante en anglais, « a small war in a far off country, country. ». Ça veut dire... C est, c est c'est quelque chose qui a l'air de ne pas être important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the mercenary careers of Breton soldiers in the service of Robert, Duke of Bar, 1372 to 1373. Monsieur Jones. Madame la Présidente, merci beaucoup. <laughs> <laughs> J'ai connu Anne depuis plus de... Oh. <laughs> Combien d'années oui, oui. Quand j elle quand était euh, quand étudiante de recherche. Oui, oui, oui. Oui, oui, oui. oui. Bon. <laughs> bon. <coughs> bon. I am greatly amazed, wrote the English mercenary captain Sir John Thornbury in 1380 to the Republic of Siena, his employers, that you do not wish to maintain your promises. If you do not make the aforementioned payments as you are obliged by your pacts, You will have to excuse us that we also do not obey the pacts made between ourselves and your commune. Fin de citation. The example comes from William Caffero's fine study of John Hawkwood. But the problem is a common one, as we are all well aware. On what terms were late medieval soldiers hired, how were they paid, and what happened when payments were not forthcoming? I shall mainly be illustrating that theme from the experiences of a small band of Breton soldiers who were engaged by Robert I, Duke of Bar, in 1372. In several respects, the account simply reinforces the broad conclusions which I reached in an earlier paper about the fortunes of a famous group of 14th century Breton soldiers, those who fought on the Franco-Breton side in the celebrated chivalric encounter, the Battle of the Thirty, in 1351. Thus, the social background, length and variety of military service of those engaged in 1372 and the way in which their careers developed will be considered. I hope that this will contribute to a fuller appreciation of their part in warfare during the later 14th century phase of the Hundred Years' War, a period in which Bretons are found in large numbers in many scattered theatres of war. There's also a political dimension that deserves some attention the extent to which choices made during the Breton War of Succession, uh, 1341 to 1365, about which side to support, may still have been important in later decades in determining why some men continued to seek uh, mercenary employment outside Brittany. The particular case with which I start uh, supplies some evidence relevant, I think, to this current debate. On the 30th of November 1372, Jean de Malestois, a chevalier, his brother Hervé de Malestois, écuyer, Patrie de Chateau Giron, chevalier, and Jean d'Assigny, chevalier, confirmed an agreement to serve Robert of Bar for five weeks from the 6th of December 1372 with an unspecified number of troops. These were to be paid at the rate of 25 florins a month when serving as men-at-arms or archers with three horses, and 20 florins a month if they had only two horses. In modern times, this document has been well exploited by historians since Victor Serve paraphrased it fully in 1865. It will surprise no one here that Philippe Contamine used its details on pay in his Guerre Ita et Societe. By no means unique, 
an impressive clutch of similar short-term contracts between the city of Metz and its captains in the early 1370s still survives in that town's archives. Nevertheless, the agreement between the Duke of Bar, Malestois and his companions is one of the most informative, especially with regard to relations with the indigenous population living, living around the places assigned to Bretons during their short sojourn in the Barois. In the published version of this paper, I hope to offer a, uh, um, a full transcript of, of uh, this document as a pièce justificative. Uh, so I only need to summarise briefly some of its main points here. In principle, strict terms were imposed on the exactions that could be made to maintain the troops, especially the foodstuffs and provender, when the men were in garrisons though when on Chevauche they were permitted to take reasonable amounts from Le Plat Bay while in the Duke's service. Payment was also to be made for most other provisions acquired locally. Respect for the local population was expected. The division of any spoils of war between the Duke, uh, his allies, the citizens of Metz and the Bretons, notably from ransoms, was closely determined while other contingencies like reductions in numbers serving and wages owing because of illness, death or termination or, or, or departure were also carefully covered, as well as the procedures to be followed on termination of the contract. These included the return of the main letters the Bretons had received issued uh, of a general quittance, as well as rendering Suilly Castle near Verdun that had been assigned to them. I have to show this photograph because there is no longer uh, a castle at Suilly, but um, the church began as the chapel to the castle, so it's roughly in that area. In this, a garrison of 12 men were to be kept at the Breton captain's expense, except for what they could take by hunting game or acquiring hay and oats ou pat play. Otherwise, nothing was to be taken into the castle, while if the captains themselves wished to aller et battre ou demeurer ou dit châtel, à plus grosse ou de fer, le pourriens, mais nous serions tenus de payer toutes les choses except chassions, volailles, foin et avoine, which they too could take from the surrounding countryside for five days. If they stayed longer, they were to pay for all they took. The Duke's provost was to be allowed to continue living in the castle with his family in order to administer the prevote as he had done previously. This document was not the only one drawn up between the two parties, since reference is made to certain formes et manières plus à plein contenu et lettres de notre dit seigneur que nous en avons de lit. It was probably in these no longer surviving letters that the total number of men to be supplied would have been stipulated. We can also note reference to pre-existing obligations which the Breton captains owed to their feudal lords, first to the King of France and his brothers, and also to the Duke of Brittany. This may hint that John IV, Duke of Brittany, was aware of their activities though they were absent from Brittany at a critical moment in the fortunes of its duke, who within six months would be driven once more into exile in England. In particular, the agreement stated that only following a summons from Charles V would they be allowed to break their contract. They were to give a week's notice to, of the royal order, nor were they to enter into any other new agreement with another party, which might result in them opposing the Duke of Bar until a week after the 10th of January, 1373. We will come back to what happened on the termination of the contract, but some background information on personalities and events is required for context. First, it must be emphasised that the four named captains came from long-established families of the Breton noblesse, not from obscure lineages. Opportunists, perhaps, uh, but none were arrivist. The senior lines of the Assini and Chateau Giron families, both from ille vilaine are traceable from before the year 11, uh, 1050. 
while Jean and Hervé de Malestroit descended from Galant de Chateau Giron, who in the mid-13th century married the heiress of the Lordship of Oudon, Loire Atlantique. Alain, their younger son, inherited Oudon, strategically sited on the banks of the Loire from where it could exact tolls, while his son, Hervé, uh, who died in 1345, in turn married another heiress, Jeanne de Maletois, whose ancestor, Paganus Dominus Malestrict, is first mentioned around the year 1130. The couple's eldest son, Jean I, who died in 1374, succeeded to the lordship of Maletois in the Morbihan and fathered a Jean, Jean II, Hervé and two other sons. John II was probably born between 1330 and 1340, since he was possibly already married by 1355, as he certainly was by 1364, to his first wife, Louis de Chamilly, uh, heiress of Guy, Sire de Chamilly, and Isabeau de Machecoul, who brought her husband lands at Brissac in Maine-et-Loire and Mortagne on, in the Vendée. On the 14th of March, 1364, Jean uh, appeared with his father at the foundation of a chapel dedicated to the recently canonised Saint Yves Ellery, dependent on the church of Saint Gilles de Maletois. Six months later, it's probable that both he, Hervé and his father uh, fought for Charles de Blois, a Duke of Brittany, at the Battle of Auray on the 29th of September, 1364. Froissart confidently reports the death of the banneret Lycia de Malatra, but other evidence shows that Jean I and his two sons survived, though all three were most likely taken prisoner. Nothing is known of what, about what ransoms they may have paid. Free by the 31st of January 1366, and with a second wife, Marguerite de, Lo de Loéac from ille vilaine the younger Jean agreed to renounce whatever lands he might be, co might be coming to the couple from his parents in return for a rent of £700 per annum. Eventually, Jean II uh, did succeed as the principal heir of Jean I when he died in 1374. Since in 1375, uh, Jean II gave his two surviving brothers, Thibault and Alain, their portions. The absence of Hervé from this patage and the lack of any convincing later references to him adds weight to the supposition that he was already dead, though he left at least three sons to succeed him. After transacting this family business in Brittany, Jean II seems to have left the duchy to pursue his military career, which now took a decisive turn. On the 1st of May 1376, he was engaged by Pope Gregory XI to lead troops into Italy. His men mustered at Carpentras on the 18th of May, and by early June he had reached Milan. As far as can be told, he never ever returned to Brittany before his death near Naples on the 21st of October 1382. In 1383, his widow, Marguerite de Loéac, remarried Guillaume de Montauban, senior de Landal, uh, in the ille vilaine Jean and Marguerite had had an only daughter, Jeanne, who died in 1429, and it was she who took the lordship of Malatois to two successive husbands, first an elderly but close relative, Jean de Malestois, Sire de Beaumont, who died in 1416, and then to a Norman exile in Brittany, Philippe de Vierville, Seigneur de Creuilly, who died in 1449. Despite evidence for the solid standing of the Malitois family amongst the better-off Breton noblesse in the generations of Jean I, Jean II and Jeanne, it is clear from the renewal of the Anglo-French War in 1369 that Jean II had devoted himself almost exclusively to military affairs followed in this by his brother Hervé. In January 1371, for instance, uh, Jean was with uh, Sylvester Bude, who later accompanied him to Italy, at the castle of saint Bazet in the Lot et Garonne, under the general command of uh, Louis-Duc uh, d'Anjou, 
while the English besieged Montpont uh, in the Dordogne, then in the hands of a Breton garrison. In September 1371, he was still with Anjou and Olivier de Clisson, now at the siege of Montcontour at Vienne, one of the earliest actions in the reconquest of Poitou from the English. Acquittance of the 15th of September 1371 shows he was leading a company of nine knights and 51 esquires. Nothing more is then heard of him until the 16th of November 1372 when he gave another quittance, this time to the city of Metz, for payments received while serving against Pierre de Bar, Lord of Pierrefort, and his allies. A fortnight later, he agreed the contract with which we began with Robert Duke de Bar, uh, then also allied with Metz in the war against his close relative, the Lord of Pierrefort. A quittance from Patrie de Chateau Giron and Jean d'Arcini, also given to the Messin in, on the 5th of December 1372, shows that they too were already serving alongside the Maletois. As noted already, both the Chateau Giron and Assini enjoyed much the same social standing as the Maletois on the fringes of the uh, upper ranks of the Breton nobility. Patrie de Chateau Giron had certainly succeeded his father, Armel I, Seigneur de Chateau Giron, by 1358, though he may still have been a minor. According to the 17th century Breton genealogist, Père uh, Dupatz, he was captured at Auré, but Patry quickly took up arms again in 1369, serving in Anjou with a small company of 12 esquires under Amari de Cran. The record for the next three years is blank, but he appears in the Barrois with the Maletois. This freelance service seems, with a brief exception noted below, to have been an isolated incident in his career, because he later returned to royal service, giving acquittance while serving in Perigord and the Limousin on the 9th of April 1376. In October 19, uh, 1377, he was appointed Seneschal of the Quercy by Louis Duc d'Anjou, a post he still occupied in November 1378. However, on the return of John IV, uh, Duke of Brittany, from exile in England, Patry pr proffered his homage on the 9th of December 1379, and the rest of his long life, he was still possibly alive in 1416, was largely spent in ducal service. Under John IV, he was uh, Keeper of Dinan, in the Côte d'Armor between 1382, while a new ducal castle, which is now on the screen, was being built. And from at least 13, March 1388, he was a chamberlain and councillor of the duke, receiving a pension and several other tokens of favour. His other brief spell as a mercenary apparently occurred in 1385, when he had permission to serve in arms in Castile, promising to return if the Duke requested um, him to do so. Just over a year later, on the 15th of October 1386, he was paid 200 francs by the Duke for a mission to Navarre, accomplished a few months earlier to seek Princess Joan of Navarre, who had eventually arrived in Brittany to marry John IV as his third wife in September 1386. Under the next Duke, John V, Patry, now a senior figure at court, was named first great chamberlain in 1406. Probably since 1404, he'd also been Marshal of Brittany, a post he held for several years, before being succeeded in it by his eldest son, Armel. Patry may have been one of the conservators of the Anglo-Breton truce of 1411, and he last appears, though lacking any household title, in the Ducal Council in 1414. Jean d'Assini was probably the youngest of the four Breton captains in 1372. On the 15th of March 1358, Guy XII, Seigneur de Laval et de Vitré, agreed to reconstruct the castle of Assini in the Ile Vilaine for Jean, who was in his guardianship. The presence of a mot, domus and herbe germentum, held by John's ancestors, mostly styled milites, is well documented from the early 13th century onwards. 
It is probable that whatever buildings occupied the site in the mid-14th century, they had been damaged during the Civil War. La Motte d'Assigny was to be sacked again during the Wars of Independence at the end of the 15th century, though traces of it uh, still survive. Sadly, I haven't got a, a photo. By early 1371, Jean d'Assigny was serving under his fellow countryman, the recently appointed constable of France, Bertrand de Guéclin, as a chevalier, the only reference I've found to his military experience before he too provided acquittance to the Messin and agreed to serve Robert de Barre in November 1372. Like that of Patrie de Chateau-Giron, this mercenary interlude was apparently brief. When the Truce of Bruges expired in 1377, Jean d'Assigny uh, served again with the constable before also making his peace with John IV of Brittany. Like most Breton nobles and gentry did, he swore to observe the Second Treaty of Guérande, drawn up in April 1381, establishing peace between the Duke and Charles VI of France. He performed homage and became a trusted counsellor, ambassador, hostage for, and even executor of John IV. On his death around 1400, he was succeeded by his son, Jean II, probably the Chevalier d'Assigny, who escaped death at the Battle of Nicopolis, uh, one of only three Bretons out of a troop of about 120 men uh, who were serving there, thus ensuring the family's survival for many more generations. When had these four closely linked Breton captains arrived in the Barrois, which lay more than 600 kilometres distant from the Duchy of Brittany? They were not the first Bretons to have fought in the region in recent years. Some had come when the menace of the great companies grew in the early 1360s, fighting either with or against the archpriest Arnaud de Cervol. He swept up from Burgundy in 1363 with a force which included many Bretons to assist Henry de Joinville, Comte de Vaudemont, against the Dukes of Lorraine and Bar campaigned against Vaudemont and Lorraine in 1364-5, before being recruited by Henri, uh, Lord of Pierrefort, and his son Pierre for their war against the, me uh, the men of Metz. This arose from a sale of land in 1361 by their relative, Robert, Duke of Bar, uh, which became the subject of a family quarrel, when Robert was unable to redeem the mortgage and another relative, Ferry de Bar, canon of Liège, currently the heir presumptive of Robert de Bar, tried to exercise retrait lignagère before ceding his rights to his cousin, Henri Seigneur de Pierrefort. It embroiled Metz because the Messin uh, challenged the legality of these family transactions, claiming infringement of their own judicial rights. Surviving accounts of Ducal Prévost in the Barrois between 1361 and 1366 refer to damage caused by the Bretons, ransoms, patty exacted, expenses incurred uh, combating these incursions. Some relief was gained first when in the autumn of 1365 Bertrand de Guéclin recruited large numbers of these freebooters to go in support of Henry de Trastamara, claimant to the Castilian throne, and secondly with the assassination of the archpriest in May 1366. But after a few years of uneasy peace, some long-standing vendettas reopened and new conflicts broke out. There's no time here to explore the kaleidoscopic series of events which followed the renewal of Pierre de Bar's war with Metz in 1368, initially supported by Robert I. This was briefly suspended in 1370, only to break out again in the summer of 1371, by which time Robert I had changed sides and was now allied with the Messins. It was at this point that all parties began seriously recruiting troops from among the no local nobles and the burgeoning market offered by foreign companies despite the general renewal of the Anglo-French war. Bon, bon, c'est de Guetlin. Bon. Um, Metz led the way. 
On the 8th of July 1371, it took one of the most colourful contemporary leaders of mercenaries, Owen of Wales, the last ha uh, prince of the House of Gwynedd, with 120 men at arms into service for a month. On the 4th of September, terms were agree agreed with Joël Roland of Brittany at the head of a, a, une rote ou compagnie de 300 combattants ou plus de Breton for 3,000 florins per month. And they were paid off in, uh, on the 7th of November when Jewel delivered this uh, general quittance for whatever was owing for their services during the war against the Duke of Lorraine and Pierre de Bar, with whom they'd agreed a truce. Judging by the sums mentioned in these quittances, the force of lances and archers which Roland had supplied was the largest employed by the Messin between 1371 and 3. Though Jeanne de Malatois would eventually take into Italy an army which at one point numbered 1,843 lances, it is likely that he and his fellow captains in 1372 had much more modest forces than those under the command of Roland in the previous year each perhaps a few score men uh, at arms at most. They were hired chiefly for the Duke's siege of Sampini, uh, a small town in the Meuse Valley, southeast of Verdun and west of Toul. After this had been successfully captured in a short winter campaign, relations with the Duke of Bar deteriorated. By January 1373, the Bretons had passed into the service of his enemy, Pierre de Bar. <laughs> their reasons for changing side are not clear. It may simply have been that as their contract had expired on the 10th of January, they simply accepted uh, a new offer of employment. But from a later agreement of October 1373 concerning Jean de Maletois, it is evident that Duke Robert had not paid all the wages which the Maletois brothers expected, so this may have been the deciding factor. What is certain is that released from Robert's employment and no longer restricted to their contract, uh, to, uh, by their contract to respect the lives and property of the local population, they indulged in an orgy of rapine. Jean de Malitois himself took Gondricourt in the south, uh, to the south of saint Michel and southwest of Toul, which he occupied uh, for 15 days before uh, burning the town. Well, a view, view from the castle and again uh, the church survives despite the burning of Gondricourt. He also took the small town of saint Thibault further to the south. But the capture of his brother Hervé put a break on these actions. Negotiations for his ransom uh, led eventually to peace terms. In turn, for the release of Hervé and Guillaume Canet, who was taken with him, the Maletois brothers renounced further acts of violence against the Duke of Bar and his subjects. The accord was drawn up at Bar-le-Duc on the 30th of March 1373. How much was paid to obtain the prisoner's release is not known. But on the 1st of October 1373 at Reims, in the presence of Jean de Cran, Archbishop of Reims, uncle to the Malestois, Robert Duke of Bar conceded that he still owed them money for their services, offering a thousand francs in return for any letters which they still possessed. At least a hundred francs outstanding was handed over to the Duke by the Provost of Saint Michel in November to payer et convertir à Messieurs Jean de Malétroit à qui Monsieur le devoir. In the meantime, the Bretons had left the Barrois, having also been released from their service by Pierre de Bar, after he had been forced to come to terms with his many enemies at pont a mousson on the 23rd of March 1373, paying compensation of 18,000 francs and agreeing to dismiss Malitois. He is next found in the Long Dock in June 1374, with his company of 120 men being mustered at Montpellier. The rest of his hectic military career must be summarised succinctly, since it's already attracted considerable scholarly attention. In, May, in August 1374, he was recruited by King James of Majorca for a campaign in the Roussillon, 
before invading Sardine and occupying Urgell. But with the death of James in February 1375, his armies disbanded, and um, Jean de Malitois was charged by the king's sister, the Marquise de Montferrat, to take the troops back to France. In doing so, he traversed the lands of Gaston Febu, Count of Foix, agreeing at Ortez on the 7th of May 1375 with 11 fellow captains, mostly from the Midi, to keep to the uh, routes, the roads indicated to them by Gaston's guides and to pay indemnities for any damage caused. He was then recruited, um, along with some former companions, by Engrand de Cousy to pursue the latter's territorial claims against his relative, Leopold II of Habsburg, in Alsace and Switzerland, a campaign linked with one of Charles V's periodic attempts to rid his realm of Routier by encouraging them to sign up for service in a foreign land. It was on his return from the Swiss cantons that Malitois divided his father's heritage uh, with his two surviving brothers, one of whom, Thibault, was now carving out for himself an ecclesiastical career that saw him elected first as Bishop of Treguier in 1378 and then of Quimper in 1383. It was in ecclesiastical service that we next meet Jean himself when contracted by Gregory XI to lead papal forces into northern and central Italy. Asked by the Pope whether he thought he could take Florence, he is famously said to have replied, does the sun enter there? If the sun can enter, so can I. <laughs> by July 1376, the army had reached Modena and then Bologna, and in, by October it was near Cassena, before some troops were di di diverted to Rimini. In November, 1,500 Bretons attacked Farno, but 300 of them still left at Cassena were massacred there. In January 1377, um, Robert of Geneva, the papal legate who acted as Gregory XI's general, summoned the remaining Bretons and John Hawkwood back to Cassena. Rioting broke out, and as most of you will know, on the 3rd of February, in revenge for the murder of their companions, the Bretons, with Sylvester Bude in particular to the fore, perpetrated one of the worst uh, notorious massacres of civilian population of the late Middle Ages. After the massacre, uh, Malitois stayed on in Cassena for several months before moving off in late August to invade the Duchy of Spoleto at the Pope's behest with some 4,000 men, but without Bude. When Gregory XI died in March 1378, Malitois passed briefly into the service of anti-Pope Clement VII, probably joining up again with Bude early in 1379. He was thus present when Alberigo de Barbiano inflicted a famously crushing defeat on the Bretons at Marino near Rome on the 28th of April. Bude was captured along with Bernard de la Salle, who has already been mentioned in these proceedings, and other captains, effectively bringing an end uh, to the main threat of foreign mercenary companies in the peninsula, but heralding too the rise of Italian successors. Malitois himself appears to have escaped capture. By June 1380, with greatly reduced numbers, he was serving Queen Joanna of Naples. In 1382, in July, he joined his former commander, Louis of Anjou, when he arrived to claim the inheritance which the Queen had left him. It was in skirmishing near Naples on the 21st of October 1382 that Malitois, probably in his mid-forties, met his end. A few general points can be made to conclude this very partial summary of a mercenary experience of this group of Breton nobles. There's no doubt that Jean de Malitois was no a notable military figure who for over a decade essentially lived by contracting out his men to a wide variety of employers in Western Europe. He left the administration of his own considerable patrimony to his wife played no part in the politics of his native duchy in a turbulent period, and left an only daughter as his heiress. 
His brother Hervé, with the prospects of a much smaller inheritance, uh, the best he could hope for was a share of the third traditionally allowed by the Breton custom to all younger siblings, followed a similar career, cut short, it would seem, by death, though he left sons to succeed. We can only speculate whether Jean and Hervé had left their homeland because they were irreconcilably um, sort of opposed to John IV and continued to support uh, the party of the late Charles de Blois, or whether they simply went for employment and for adventure, a word which also has been used on previous occasions. Uh, unfortunately, the sources are mute. For the other two um, Breton captains, Jean d'Assigny and Patrick de Chateau-Giron, who had joined the Maletois to serve Metz and then the Duke of Bar in 1372, their mercenary service appears to have been of very limited duration, less than a year, perhaps only a few months before they returned to a more normal pattern of employment for men of their status in the French Crown's service. Then, after the usual absence from Brittany, the unusual absence from Brittany of their own immediate feudal superior, who had been forced into exile by the desertion of his nobles, uh, when this came to an end, they resumed, resumed service to John IV, not just performing obligatory military duties, but both playing very active roles in shaping and executing ducal policies. The only deviation from this cursus honorum was Chateau Giron's brief spell as a renewed mercenary captain uh, in Castile in 1385. Both would leave heirs, who in turn served their dukes in war and peace, their families surviving in the forefront of Breton society throughout the 15th century. And, in the case of the Assini, well into the early modern period, by which time they had come through a series of fortuitous marriages, also, ironically, to possess the lordship of Maletois. And if you were able to read uh, the, the, um, the document on the screen, it would show two or three marriages um, between the late 14th and early 16th century between the Assini and Maletois, which eventually allows them, the Assini, to uh, uh, acquire uh, Maletois. Thank you very much. Mm. Mm.